And joining us now, Jeffrey Jensen Arnett. He is research professor in the Department of Psychology at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, and the author of Emerging Adulthood. And he joins us on the line from Boston. Jeffrey, good to have you on the program. How are you tonight? I'm doing well, thanks. Glad to hear it. Let's start by my just reading something that was in the New York Times earlier this summer. The 20s, the New York Times tells us, are a black box. And there is a lot of churning in there. One third of people in their 20s move to a new residence every year. 40% move back home with their parents at least once. They go through an average of seven jobs in their 20s, more job changes than in any other stretch. Two thirds spend at least some time living with a romantic partner without being married. And marriage occurs later than ever. The median age at first marriage in the early 1970s, when the baby boomers were young, was 21 for women and 23 for men. By 2009, it had climbed to 26 for women and 28 for men, five years in a little more than a generation. Okay, lots of implications to unpack there, Jeffrey. So let's start with this, this uh, concept, which may be new to some of our viewers, of emerging adulthood. How would you define that? Well, I would say it's a new life stage that's in between adolescence and young adulthood. As the information you were just giving shows, 30 is the new 20. People used to enter a sort of stable young adulthood by the age of 21 or 22. They were finished with their education. They were married or about to be married. They were uh, new parents or about to become new parents. And they had basically settled into the structure of an adult life. Now those transitions mostly take place closer to 30. So people stay in education longer than they ever did before. More people get post-secondary education than, than ever before. People marry later, people have their first child later, and they have fewer children than was true 50 years ago. Put it all together, and the 20s become entirely different than they were half a century ago. Now they're this period of exploration and instability. Instead of settling into adult life, people are trying out lots of different alternatives before they make the transition to stable commitments. Is this a purely North American phenomenon? No, actually it's, it's occurring all over the world. It exists in all in industrialized countries. In fact, you gave the marriage ages for the U.S., but in Canada and all over Europe, as well as in industrialized Asian countries such as Japan and South Korea, ages of entering marriage and parenthood are even later. So you could say that, that the U.S. has actually a shorter emerging adulthood than all these other countries. It's a worldwide phenomenon. So this does present some interesting intergenerational arguments uh, that could take place because I, I, I guess it's fair to say now that the milestones that maybe our parents or grandparents expected us to hit in our 20s, we're not going to now, and that's okay. Is that right? Well, it's okay. For most parents, it's a source of some anxiety, though, because a lot of parents, and especially grandparents, are measuring today's emerging adults' progress according to a standard from 30, 40, 50 years ago when people did enter adulthood earlier. And so they measure today's emerging adults by that standard sometimes and find them wanting. And there's the sense that they're lazy, they won't take responsibility, uh, they won't take on the commitments that previous generations did. They do take on those commitments. That stereotype is not really fair. They do take on those commitments. They just do it later than before. And in their 20s, they're by no means lazy. They're, in fact, working very hard at a series of low-paying jobs, most of them, while they try to find some kind of work that they want to commit themselves to and that they can really enjoy. Well, this is key. Let me follow up on that. And we'll just use one example of, uh, and we hear it more and more these days, of the, um, you know, the young person who graduates from university and rather than going out on their own, finding their own place, uh, they're moving back home with mom and dad. Now, once upon a time, that might have been seen as a kind of a, uh, an awkward or a slacker's thing to do. Uh, from what I've been able to see, most young people do it today because it's a good business decision. They get rent free and it, it allows them to save some money. So again, is that part of the, the need to kind of redefine where we're at these days? It is, and it's part of the negative stereotype. And again, it's ex exaggerated. First of all, most of them don't move home after they moved out. You gave the figure early, 40% in the U.S. move home at least once after moving out. So it's not even the majority of them. Secondly, when they do move home, it tends to be for a temporary and relatively brief period of maybe six months to a year. It tends to be 
while they're waiting for a new job to start or when they're between jobs or when they've gone back to school to get more education or something has happened with their living situation where they need a temporary place to be. But almost none of them really want to live at home, even if it is cheaper there and in many ways easier with parents still preparing the meals and doing the laundry and so on. They would much rather live on their own because that way they can make their own decisions without parents interference. Okay, you've described the phenomenon and that it is happening now. Why is it happening now? Well, a lot of different reasons. One key reason is the way the economy has changed from a mainly manufacturing economy 50 years ago to now a more information and services and technology economy. The jobs in the new economy take longer to prepare for. And so that's one of the reasons people are, are staying in education longer. Another key reason is that premarital sex and cohabitation in most industrialized countries, including the U.S., and Canada is now widely tolerated, if not exactly accepted, by older adults. And so most people cohabit before marriage. You don't have to enter marriage anymore to have a regular sex life. But it's a bigger change, too, I think, in the way we look at adulthood. Adulthood now is viewed with a lot of ambivalence, especially by young people. They realize that once you take on the commitments of adulthood, you really are going to be in that structure you've committed yourself to for a long time, maybe the rest of your life. And they, I think very wisely, realize that the 20s is the time to do the things you can only do while you have the freedom of emerging adulthood. But that kind of depends on mom and dad's nickel, doesn't it? I mean, that is one of the downsides of that view. Well, no, it doesn't entirely. I mean, many of them do get some financial help from their parents during their 20s. But they're not really depending on mom and dad's nickel to have their fun. Most of them live at a very low level in terms of material consumption. They don't generally drive a nice car or live in a real nice apartment or, or go on fabulous vacations. They're mostly just scraping by because the jobs they have don't pay very well. But it's true they do want to use their 20s to try things that they don't have the chance to do later. And sometimes their parents do make that possible for them. Okay, let's look, Jeffrey, at the science of this because we've done numerous programs here on the agenda of uh, looking at the brain and how the brain continues to change. It's very mutable during the uh, early years, even in the teenage years. And I'm wondering if the emerging adulthood brain is also transforming as it does during the teenage years. Well, I think it does, but I don't think that has much to do with this new life stage I'm talking about. People had basically the same brains 50 years ago as they do now, when there wasn't any life stage of emerging adulthood. During that time, the brain hasn't changed, but our social and cultural and economic conditions have changed a lot. And that's what's really responsible for this new life stage. It's always been possible for the brain to change and grow through the 20s. In fact, being 53, I sure hope it continues to grow in the decades that, that follow, because I like to think I'm a little smarter now than I was 25 or 30 years ago. No question about that. How you think young people perceive adulthood today compared to the way maybe yours and my generation or our parents' generation looked at adulthood uh, when we were at that stage of the game. What do you think? Well, that's one of the most fascinating things that I've found in interviewing emerging adults is how ambivalent they are about reaching adulthood. I think 50 years ago, entering adulthood was a big achievement. It was something that people really looked forward to. That was the World War II and Great Depression generation. When they reached adulthood in the 50s, in early 60s, they were really looking forward to the stability and security that adulthood provided. Now, 50 years later, after 50 years of, of affluence and greater opportunity and uh, greater uh, opportunities, especially for women in American society, Canadian society, and all over Europe, people don't really look adult, at adulthood the same way anymore. They look at it as a kind of stagnation. They, they see their parents and they feel like they don't grow anymore. They don't do interesting things anymore. And so they don't really want to rush into adult life. That's why they want to use their 20s to have as much fun and as much experience as they can. Because when they look at adulthood, they don't think it looks like that much fun. Well, they know they will eventually. And most of them do take on adult responsibilities, as I've been saying, in, in marriage and parenthood stable full-time work by age 30, but they're not in any hurry to get there for the most part when they're 20 or 23 or for some of them even 27 or 28. 
There's also a new concept that's, uh, I guess, referred to this generation in particular, helicopter parents who are hovering over their kids all the time, uh, not letting them perhaps develop the independence that they ought to. Do you think that has created a role in a, you know, in this emerging adulthood where dependence on parent is perhaps lasting longer than it did in generations earlier? Well, not really. I actually have been interviewing parents lately. I'm going to write an advice book for parents of emerging adults. So I've been interviewing a lot of them lately. And what I find, and what a lot of other researchers found, that they're actually very happy when their kids leave home. It opens up all sorts of opportunities in their own life that they've been postponing or putting on the back burner for the last 20 or 25 years. So when their kids leave home and go from adolescence to emerging adulthood and become more independent, more capable of taking care of their own lives, parents for the most part are feeling pretty good about it. They get to do their own leisure activities, they get to have more time for their marriage, and so it's by and large welcome for parents. But the one part of parenting that, that is part of this, I think, is that parents really have encouraged their kids in the last 50 years to be who they want to be, go out and go after your dreams, try to achieve everything you can. Children now who have grown up with that sort of parenting ethic really believe it, and they, they believe they can do whatever they want. They believe they should aim high and strive for everything they can, and that's one of the reasons they take so long to, settle, to, set, to settle into steady work, is that they have very high expectations for the work they're going to do, and it takes them quite a while to find a job that they find satisfying enough to commit themselves to. Well, let me follow up on something you said earlier, because you did talk about how this was a phenomenon across the Western world, and I want to make sure that our viewers know who you're referring to and who you're not referring to. There is this stereotype, and I, and I hope the Italian community will forgive me for picking on them for a second here, but there is this stereotype of the 45-year-old Italian man uh, in Italy who still lives at home, or maybe in some North American neighborhoods as well, and, you know, he's still living at home, uh, not paying rent, mom is still making all his meals and doing his laundry. Uh, emerging adulthood does not last until the age of 45 or 50, does it? Not even for Italians, no. I actually have <laughs> interviewed uh, emerging adults in Italy, so I have some knowledge of this. And they do tend to stay home until marriage, which for them takes place at about age 30, not at, not at age 45 on average. But until then, they usually do remain at home, and they do enjoy the comforts of home. They enjoy their parents making the meals and taking care of the bills and so on. But at the same time, they have a lot of independence. They basically live their own lives. They go out with friends, boyfriends, girlfriends. They work uh, full time. And then they just come home, and they have a really close relationship with their parents. It's not a bad thing, really. They, they and their parents both derive a lot of satisfaction from their close relationship. And there's a long tradition in Italy and all over Southern Europe of that kind of family closeness. You see it also in the US, and I'm sure Canada, too, among uh, families that have Asian background or Latino background, they also tend to remain home for longer. And it's because of this ethic of, of staying close to the family and, and remaining inside the family embra embrace until you're ready to move on and get married. Okay, let me in our remaining moment here just ask you one last thing, and that's finally, you've spent a great deal of your life paying attention to this phase of life. Why do you think it's so important to pay attention to this emerging phase of our lives? Well, I think because it really is a new life stage, and it's important for all of us to understand what's going on during these years so that we can know what's going on with either ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our employees, or just so that we can have a better understanding of, of life from their point of view. And I think that, that way we can avoid the sort of negative stereotypes that have grown up around them, that they're lazy, they're selfish, and so on, none of which uh, I have found to be true in interviewing hundreds of them. And I think there are a lot of positive things about this phase of life that we should all appreciate, like their optimism and their energy and their creativity. I have found many times that when people hear about emerging adulthood, parents as well as emerging adults themselves find it really reassuring to hear that this is what's normal now, is to be very unsettled for most of your 20s. And it's reassuring to know, too, that for almost everybody, by about the age of 30, emerging adulthood is over. They're ready to move on to the commitments of adult life. They don't remain emerging adults forever. 
And just for the record, Jeffrey, you moved out of your parents' house at what age, and did you ever move back in? I moved out at the age of 18. I moved back in at the age of 23 because I was a musician at the time and not making enough money to support myself. So I moved back in for a couple of years. And those were two very nice years with my parents before I moved out to go to graduate school, and I have never been back since then. <laughs> Terrific. Okay. Uh, it's awfully good of you to join us on the line from Boston. Jeffrey Jensen Arnett, thanks so much. My pleasure.